Good evening, parents, staff, teachers, family members, and most importantly, the graduating class of 2021. It really is such an honor to address you all tonight, and I'll try my best to live up to this wonderful occasion. My name is Evelyn Mayo, and I graduated from uwc -SEA in 2013. I really cherish the time that I spent at UWC, from the late night studio time during Ivy Art, to the weekend dance show rehearsals, to the long walks down the drive to the Hawkers. It fills me with joy to recall those days. Just like I was eight years ago, I imagine that you are all filled with excitement, anticipation for what is next to come, but also some trepidation and maybe anxiety about leaving the comforts of this community. This may be a feeling many of you are familiar with, having left home to do the IB program in Singapore as scholars, or maybe your family has moved around several times and so being in a new environment is second nature to you. Regardless, this feeling is important. You are anxious and excited because you're about to be in a new and unfamiliar place. There are people out there right now who are going to change your life, and many of these people will have no idea what it's like to go to a school like UWC or to grow up all over the world. You might be asking, will it be difficult to connect with people who have such different experiences than me? Will it matter whether or not you engage with a new place if all you're ever going to do is leave? If you're returning to your home country, will it ever feel like home? Today, I want to tell you how I found some of the answers to these questions. It's a story about a gigantic, toxic mountain of trash in Dallas, Texas. Let's start at the beginning. I'm from the US, but spent my entire primary and secondary education abroad. I had the privilege of living in France, Japan, Australia, and finally Singapore from ages six to 18. My mom was born and raised in Oklahoma, a poor rural state in the plains of the US, and my dad was an army kid who moved around to various military bases across the US. Both of them left the country at the first chance they got in their 20s and decided pretty early that they wanted us, me and my sisters, to have the benefit of exposure to many cultures and experiences as well. In our summer holidays, my sisters and I would split our time between my dad's side of the family in Massachusetts and my mom's side in Oklahoma. My experiences of the US firsthand were confined to about one month per year of fun summer time with my cousins, as I'm sure is the case with many of you. My experiences of being an American, however, were much more influenced by the remaining 11 months of the year spent outside my country of origin. The first time I remember thinking that America was a dark, scary place was 9-11. I was six years old, we had just moved to France. I was in my classroom and could barely understand what my teacher was saying because I was still learning the language. But I could feel it. The cold dread and tinge of shame at the unwanted attention of suddenly being affiliated with a place that experienced such a traumatic event. As a child, I didn't know any better. So naturally, I internalized part of that experience. America is where people die. 9-11, of course, prompted one of the most misguided and long wars in our history under the leadership of former President George Bush. I learned very quickly that he too was a source of shame and fear, but also ridicule. When I hit puberty, I was living in Tokyo, Japan. Similar to France, me and my sisters were put in Japanese public school. And while learning the language, I was also grappling with the typical growing pains of puberty feeling too big, feeling too loud. This was compounded by the recent hit documentary, Super Size Me, where America's addiction to salt, fat, and sugar was on full display. The consumption patterns of my country are shameful. I am the only reference point for this country, therefore I am shameful. 2008, finally, something to be proud of. The first black president in US history was elected. I started to feel something I hadn't felt before in relation to my country, that I felt very little claim to, but a lot of accountability for. By the time I was set to graduate from UWC in 2013, President Obama had just been reelected for his second term in office, Black Lives Matter was just a statement, not yet a movement, and I felt excited about repatriating to the US and confronting my complicated relationship with my country and my identity. 
Little did I know that in the next eight years, there would be a rise in white supremacy, backtracking on much needed climate action, continued police brutality, a global pandemic, and increased political division, often caused by faceless private entities. When I got to the US, my goal was to feel connected. I wanted to understand America. I wanted to feel love for Americans outside of my family. Not because I believe in patriotism, but because I believe that accepting my own American identity would require understanding theirs. I wanted to prove that for all the violence and tragedy that I saw from the outside as a kid growing up abroad, I could find joy and meaning as an adult citizen of the United States. In 2017, I moved to Dallas, Texas. I wanted to be in a Southern conservative state after President Trump was elected because I believe that was where I would find the most purpose and the most opportunity for impact. I quickly started organizing around environmental justice issues, which are abundant, due to the lack of regulations and enforcement by the state or federal government. The group I joined, Downwinders at Risk, was founded on the belief that through grassroots community organizing, we can create both cleaner air and better democracy. That is, without a democratic process, there can be no good environmental outcomes. Time and time again, I have found this to be true. My work sense has revolved around community organizing and environmental research to improve the process to be more equitable and inclusive, and ultimately for better environmental outcomes. For the last two and a half years, I've been working on an illegal dump called Shingle Mountain. It's a 100,000 ton mountain of illegally dumped roof shingles, along with tires and other toxic materials, that piled up day after day for 11 months next to Miss Marsha Jackson's home in South Oak Cliff, a majority black and brown, low-income neighborhood. Seeing the mountain for the first time was terrifying. It towered over the residential homes, smelled like burning asphalt, and made my skin itch. It seemed impossible, but at the same time, necessary. There was no option that involved leaving it there. That would mean condemning Marsha and her neighbors to a slow, cancerous death, a fate all too common for low-income Black people in the U.S. So we started organizing. We rallied local nonprofits, church leaders, teachers, other residents, um, and called for the immediate cleanup and investigation onto how this happened, why it was happening. We did air monitoring, produced research papers, got the local, state, and national media involved. There were lawsuits filed. We hosted a moving accountability convoy, putting the council people responsible on trial and so much more. For two and a half years, we fought and fought and fought with every tool in the toolbox. Why? Because no one else was and no one else would. This was the result of the status quo. On February 26, 2021, the last truck of shingles left the site. The mountain is gone. We proved that together we could move mountains and we did. I'm now working with the neighborhood residents on getting the site dedicated as a park and gathering place to commemorate the, hard fi the fight hard won and provide a much needed place for rest and community. Although the park is not there yet, I dream about the day that I walk it with Miss Jackson and we smell flowers instead of asphalt. We hear the breeze through the trees instead of the sound of machinery. We feel love instead of shame. There's so much darkness in the world, but for every injustice, there's an army of people fighting it. That army is the army that helped me feel at home in a country that I wasn't sure I could. Interlocking arms physically at a protest or metaphorically in a meeting with an elected official has been the most assuring way for me to connect with the history of the United States. It is a history of struggle where I am but a link in a long chain of people that came before me and many more that will come after. And to be clear, no one that I fought with understood firsthand what it was like to grow up as an American abroad. And I sure don't know what it means to grow up African-American in Texas. But together, we saw what was unfair and violent and unhealthy in our immediate physical surroundings. Together, we created a vision for a better version of our city. And together, we fought tooth and nail to make that vision a reality. And now we share an extraordinarily important and meaningful experience. Together, despite our diverse backgrounds and upbringings, we are the people that fought and moved 
Shingle Mountain. Wherever you go next, I guarantee you that there is a Shingle Mountain. And in this day and age, when the entire world can feel like Shingle Mountain and so much is conspiring to make us feel alone, it's never been easier to say, screw it, kick back, watch the world burn. But don't. You have too much to give, and honestly, there's too much at stake for you not to get out there and join the fight. Your freedom is tied up in mine, is tied up in your neighbors. Don't ever forget it. Change is very hard and democracy even more messy, but there's so much beauty and meaning in the process. Congratulations again, class of 2021, and sending so much love to you all.